Welcome to Doran College e-learning platform. Today we shall be discussing a very important topic which will benefit the current fifth semester students and anyone interested in literary theory. Well, the title of today's topic is Literary Theory and Introduction. So let me begin by drawing your attention to the terms literary criticism and literary theory. Um, Although the terms literary criticism and theory are often used interchangeably, yet there is a clear line of distinction between the two terms. Literary criticism, it has an analytical function and an evaluating function. So when we say literary criticism, basically we mean that the chief aim of criticism is to you know, analyze and evaluate the merits and demerits or faults of a literary text. In, in uh, simple words, it is the study evaluation and interpretation of literature. So there is a sense of judgment attached to it when we say criticism. On the contrary, on the other hand, theory is not judgment, but understanding of the frames of judgment. Theory is the tool used to understand the text from a certain perspective. It is the underlying principle, the lens that help us understand literature. So in the words of Patricia Wong, theory is simply how you talk about, organize and reflect upon what you have been doing as a critic. So theory provides a grammar of the literary work. So it is the lens. So when I give the example of lens, it is just like the lens, the specs which you wear. So when you wear it, you see things distinctively and quite clearly. So that is how uh, there's a definitely a distinction between the two terms, literary criticism and theory. Now let's focus on why do we need theory? So there are critics who claim that theory is something which uh, distorts the true essence of literature. There are essays such as beyond theory, against theory, or why theory. But then theory is really important because it shows us the connection between ideology and power structures. So it shows us that practice is not something natural, but is a specific historical construct. So in the words of Pramod Kinnair, Theory gives you a better, sharper way of seeing through the obvious. So it helps you to see beyond the obvious. So that is why theory is really important because it is interested in exposing the context against which meanings are formed, are constructed, or gets embedded in certain historical, social conditions, circumstances, or situations. And theory is very, very political as it upsets hierarchy. It upsets hierarchy means it. it upsets established meanings of text. So what is there in the text? What counts as truth might not be necessarily true. So that is what literary theory helps us in analyzing and evaluating. So literary theory is really important and uh, it's particularly for students and critics of literature. Now, if we are to trace the beginnings of uh, modern literary theory, then definitely we have to situate it within a historically broader context. Well, the aim of this lecture is, of course, not to provide encyclopedic coverage, but just to offer a kind of cursory treatment. Now, uh, when we say the beginnings, what I mean is modern 20th century literary criticism. So definitely modern literary theory, it had its roots in the philosophical underpinnings of various thinkers, and some of them are Nietzsche, Heidegger. Now, if we take the example of Frederick Nietzsche, uh, who proclaimed very famously that God is dead. So what does he mean by that? So there uh, he talks about how faith was actually replaced by what he termed as perspectivism or uh, in his words, no one has access to an absolute view of the world cut off from perspective. So from something which was static to perspective. So that is how these people, these philosophers, be it Heidegger, be it Nietzsche, be it the Germans, Kant and others, so their works have tremendously influenced modern day literary theory, although they were not considered to be theorists as such in the you know, present day term. Now, if we, uh, since we are talking about the beginnings, so definitely early 20th century, if we see the time period from 1930s to 1960s onwards, so there was a focus on the kind of criticism which did not articulate its theory. So there was you know, no term as theory, but then there was a kind of criticism. So um, 
Peter Barry has actually coined this beautifully and titled this as yes, theory before theory. So the, this, that was known as liberal humanism. So this liberal humanism, the theories who came before theory, uh, they believed in human nature as something which was fixed and great literature expresses that fixed essence of human beings. So literature was seen as a kind of you know replacement ideology for religion because of its timeless significance. So it was a moral duty of course or uh, to transmit the best in cultural and moral behavior. So critics and of course a writer as well like Matthew Arnold who talks about sweetness and light. So how literature would be you know it, it would be like a kind of beacon which should guide us so in his the function of criticism at present time he talks about it so if we see right from the time of honor actually there was a text-based approach there are other critics and writers such as t.s Eliot, who talks about dissociation of sensibility which means separation of thought from emotion then f l he talks about you know the great tradition and he seems to have adopted and adapted several ideas of Arnold. Now, F. L. Levis talks about life, life force and sincerity, which belongs, uh, which belong to the great traditions of war. Then I. Richards was another uh, liberal humanist. All of these are somehow associated with liberal humanism, uh, either through their ideas directly influenced or direct influence. So I. Richards, he pioneered uh, the technical practical criticism, which was also known as new criticism in America. So if you see the works of these critics and writers, so there there seems to have been a, you know, the, the tradition of close reading and that close reading paved the path for modern day critics, particularly 20th century critics uh, to, you know, uh, work to expand and adapt their work. Now, liberal humanism, Although it was success for some time, it was a huge success for some time, um, it gave ideas of what is known as essentialism, universalism. So the idea of humanism itself, the idea of individualism, the idea of the universe, unified self, the potential of human being and the prefix associated to it, liberal, it gave ideas of you know essentialism, so common human nature and kind of taken for granted way of doing literature. So critics like uh, theorist, uh, let me um, term him as a theorist such as René Wallach actually he uh, criticizes Afro Levis and he asks him to reconsider his work on the great tradition he says that practical criticism was not enough we need a theoretical assumption on which certain readings were based so that is why he says I could wish that you had stated your assumptions more explicitly and defended them systematically so there was a need for a systematic organization of doing literature which was nothing but what we know as literary theory um, there's an essay called the myth of liberal humanism where actually the critics you know addresses the issues ignored by liberal humanism some of which are the human self is a constructed self this was not considered by the liberal humanist the world views are constructed it's not natural or given there are no final truths as such. There cannot be a final truth. So these are some of the issues which the liberal humanist, you know, did not address. And probably that is the reason it failed. So uh, this, you know, failure of liberal humanist gave way or it paved the way for uh, new approaches and new theories since, you know, 1960s, some of which I have just coined it here i have just put it here but we shall be probably discussing some of this in our subsequent lectures marxism which pioneered in the 1930s and was reborn in 1960s then we have psychoanalytic criticism from 1960s onwards which was greatly influenced by the works of sigmund freud then there was the linguistic turn in the 1960s onwards beginning with ferdinand de Saussure's and others works there was early feminism from 1960s onwards structuralism and post-structuralism from 1970s and 80s new historical and cultural materialism 1980s onwards and we have post-colonialism from 1990s onwards now we have eco-criticism we have post-humanism we have animal studies we have digital humanities we have artificial intelligence incorporated into the theories and so on and on but then uh, i would like to conclude my lecture by giving a very uh, you know a beautiful definition by peter barry modern literary theory stems from the understanding that politics is pervasive language is constitutive human nature is a myth truth is contingent meaning is relative there cannot be a fixed reality there cannot be 
a fixed meaning and human nature is a myth so with this understanding the theories be it you know in, in different spheres and different fields they try to uh, bring in new perspectives and uh, definitely we shall be discussing some of this in our subsequent lectures thank you so much